Oh. Right. This is when it's very helpful to keep in mind uh, what the dynamics of the ego are. Because, because again, when you start getting rid of your guilt, the ego is going to try and give it back to you double. There are two very good pages in the text, pages 164 and 166, that can be very comforting when you're having one of these awful ego attacks. Where it talks about how the ego turns on you as you begin turning to the Holy Spirit more and more. It describes how it's at this point that the ego's suspiciousness becomes viciousness. And the viciousness will either be directed through you towards other people, in terms of you're attacking them, or be, be directed towards yourself. And again, very often this is a sign that, that things are really going well because you're getting further and further back to God. Have you ever known anybody to uh, be deeply entrenched in the course? I don't know how long, maybe after they've gone through the whole thing. And then really throw the whole thing out. Oh, sure. Lots of people do. You know, lots of people do that sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes for the wrong reasons. The right reasons will be that's not their path. And there's another path the Holy Spirit is holding out to them. The wrong reason would be obviously that it just scared them to death. You know. Uh, and at some point, the course should scare you because it's the ego that will be scared. You know, it's very threatening to the ego system. Right, so that walking this path back here is no easy uh, task, and it's not a picnic. And one of the, uh, the misconceptions people have, which comes from that, that confusion of levels, is that there are many passages in the Course that speak about, about how easy and simple all this is, that you're already home in God, so why bother getting upset? You know, all this could be over in an instant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What it's really talking about is the difference between uh, in level one, the separated world which doesn't exist, and God's world which does. But in reality, it takes, at least reality as we define it here, it takes a long time because our guilt is so, so, so firmly entrenched in us. You know, this is not an easy path. There are many, many references throughout the Course that speak of the difficulty of the path. There's one place where it says you will walk through seeming terror. And it says the word seeming because obviously this is all an illusion, but it uses the word terror because that's what it feels like. Another place when it says how we stand before the final veil, it says you stand before this veil in terror. And now you stand in terror before what you swore you would never look upon. And what we swore we would never look upon was our guilt. You know, that was the secret uh, pact that we made with the ego. You know, often it speaks of the conflict that comes between the right-minded thought system and the wrong-minded thought system. And the reason that, that I'm emphasizing all this is that when you begin to experience some of this in yourself, don't get upset. It doesn't mean, again, that you're not doing the course. It probably means that you are doing it. And that's why, again, it is so important and why it's such a major emphasis of the course to have that personal relationship with the Holy Spirit or with Jesus. So that when the going gets tough, as you go back along here, you know there's somebody who's leading you along. Otherwise, it can, can get pretty frightening. Now, the goal of the course, as we've talked about, is not to get here to God. The goal of the Course is to get to what this, this dotted green line is, represents, which is the, the real world. It says in the Course at one point that the real world is the second part of the, the hallucination. The first part of the hallucination is this. This is the nightmare. This is the hallucination that teaches us that this world is real and it's a world of separation in which attack is justified. The second part of the hallucination is this part here, which is the happy dream or the real world, because in here we are still living in the separated world, but we've changed its purpose. And we see that beyond all the illusions of separation, we are really joined as one family. We're all brothers and sisters in the same Christ. That's what the goal of the Course is. When we reach this world, then God takes the last step over here, and, and then he lifts us back into himself, and this entire world disappears. So the goal of the Course is to help us reach this. Again, it's to live in this world. It's not to transcend this world or to deny the world. What you deny in the world is your projections of guilt. This also does not mean that you deny all the things in the world that give you pleasure or that seem beautiful to you or meaningful to you. You just shift what their purpose is. Question. The Course would not say that you can't enjoy a beautiful sunset. It would just say, don't believe that that sunset is the Kingdom of Heaven. When the world disappears, would it disappear for each one of us separately? Or I'm not finished. Huh? I'll okay. answer that a little bit later. Okay. So that the Course does not teach us to deny this world. It teaches us to deny the guilt. In fact, it talks at one point about the Holy Spirit's use of denial, which is to deny the denial of guilt. Excuse me, to, to deny the denial of truth. 
Right? What the ego does is deny truth, which is guilt, and the Holy Spirit teaches us to deny the denial of truth, which is forgiveness. Would the Course say that the uh, beautiful sunset is the ego's trick to keep us on the carpet? If you believe that it's the kingdom of heaven, yes. You know, the ego will tempt us to make this world real by either seeing it as a source of pleasure or seeing it as a source of pain. But just keep in mind that the sunset, which is caused by the sun, or the, the sun which causes the sunset, can also kill. Just as the rain, which makes you know, beautiful plants and flowers and grass grow and trees grow, also can kill. So, so that nothing changes. Excuse me. That everything changes. It's really the, the interpretation that we give it. And once again, what tells us that a sunset is beautiful is the colors, and color really is something that, uh, that our sensory organs teach us about and that the brain interprets. It has no reality in reality. All right, so in, in other words, we've trained the body to believe that certain experiences in this world are beautiful and pleasurable and artistic and creative or whatever, and we've trained our bodies to believe that, that other experiences in this world are the opposite. That's all part of the body. But the Course does not say you deny that. Again, what it says is that you deny the denial of truth, which really would be guilt. You could, you could easily slip into that, that false asceticism where you believe that, which is really was the old Gnostic era, where you believe that the world is, is an illusion, therefore to get involved with the world is evil. Of course, it does not teach us not to get involved with the world. It teaches us to get involved with it in a different way. Yes, Kelly. A few times among students of the course, I've heard the statement, well, I know it's not real, but I'm just looking for a better illusion. That sounds well, that's, a little tricky. Well, well, it's a little tricky, but the, that's what the ego does. You know, the ego is always after us to, to develop better and better illusions, which means illusions which will serve the purpose of keeping our guilt uh, protected, you know, being the lid on the jar. The only better illusion that there is is forgiveness. Because that's the only one that, that takes or removes the guilt from, from the bottom of the jar. Would you repeat your, your analogy of the bottom of the jar? No, it's on the tape. Yes, it's on the tape. It's a little long, that's why. Um, all right, now the goal of the Course, again, is to help each and every one of us, each of the seeming, seemingly separate threads on the carpet, get back. Now what happens when, when one person gets back, let's say Jesus, is that the world ends for him. All right, but those who still believe in the reality of the dream will still believe that it's real. Now, well, the Course doesn't really deal with this specific part. Let me, let me tell you what I think it, it would say about it. And that is that the people who've already made it, Jesus and other kind of people who've already transcended their ego and rolled back the carpet, are waiting right here at the end, right at the end of the carpet. And what they do is they reach back to the carpet and they help everybody else do the same thing. Now, when the entire world will end, the end of time is when all the separated sons of God remember who they are and then they all rejoin as one. So that in that sense, I think we would say that Jesus would not be in heaven. All right, he's not in this world either. He's right here at the edge. Now again, the Course doesn't specifically treat this, but I think this is what it would suggest. That the, that the sonship of God is one, therefore it must return to the Father as one. Okay. Yes, same idea. Now let me talk about two uh, words that the Course uses, uh, which I haven't mentioned as yet, the second coming and the last judgment. Now the second coming of Christ uh, has been interpreted traditionally as the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. All right? That the first coming of Christ was, was, was Jesus' uh, life here on earth, and the second coming will be when he returns. Now the Course is version of that of course is different the first coming of Christ is the creation that happened over here when God created Christ the second coming of Christ will be when the dream ends and, and the awareness of Christ is restored to us so that will be right here at the end at the, at the end of the carpet at the end of, of the real world so the second coming of Christ is merely the reappearance of truth or the awareness of our true identity now restored to us then, as the Course says, this makes way for the last judgment. Now, as we saw, saw last night, the Course deliberately uses words that Christianity has interpreted one way and now gives it a different interpretation. 
The last judgment was interpreted as being the end of the world when God separated the sheep from the goats. Right? And the sheep he took to himself and the goats he kind of discarded. All right, the good guys were rewarded and the bad guys were punished. I clearly the course's view of this would be different too. That the last judgment is the final judgment that we all make when we recognize that everything on this side of the line is an illusion and everything on this side of the line is true. It's the final judgment that, that what is true, that what is false is false, as the Course says, and what is true has never changed. Now that's the judgment that we all have to make each and every moment of our lives. But the last judgment is, is what immediately follows the second coming, when we finally recognize this is all false, this is all true, and at that point the entire separated world disappears. That's the very end of the carpet, that's the end of the plan of the atonement. When the entire carpet is rolled back and disappears, as the Course would say, back into the nothingness from which it came. And then at the very end of the text it says, and, and we are home where you would have us be. There's a statement in the text that the second coming was merely the return of sins. And I read that to suggest that the second coming, rather than being any identifiable time, would be the instant when I'm willing to extend forgiveness rather than projection. Uh, well, in one sense, but I think the Course would say that that would be a reflection of the second coming. But, but the phrase, but what it says the beginning, the, the reawakening of sense, the return of sense, what it means is the return of sense to the sonship of God. It's what all of us do that. So uh, the holy instance, when we choose forgiveness instead of, instead of a grievance, uh, that would be a reflection of the light of the second coming, in that sense. So, so, the, so, the, so Jesus stands here at the end, as the world, the other uh, saints who have made it, and they reach back to help everybody else do the same thing. And then when everybody joins there, that's the second coming, that makes way for the last judgment, when this whole thing is discarded, and the carpet disappears, and we're home where we never left. Uh, what about the here the angels and archangels? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, the question was about the angels and archangels. I think it, it, you mentioned angels. Angels are mentioned in the course, yeah. and uh, angels I think could be understood as being thoughts of God. Um, and really, we just if you just think of that as being an expression of God's presence in us, but it, it doesn't talk about the angels as being beings. You know, so since, uh, since it doesn't do that with angels, it really doesn't talk about, about archangels either. Mm -hmm. You try to trip me up, Fazl. Some people say that they have seen angels. Is this the ego that they've seen? Well, anything that you see in form has to be of the ego. But uh, I think many people have experienced that there are kind of spirits on the other side who help out. And so I think that, that if you see them within a specific form, then that's the form in which you can accept what they're helping. It doesn't come from the court, my own concept of an angel is a son of God who is willing to become God's messenger. Uh, there are people in this room that are regarded as angels. Yeah, well, that, that's another use of the word angel. That's fine. I mean, yeah. The course is that would just be that that person is a messenger of God or a teacher of God. Yeah. All right, yes? Are you saying that the only beings that can reach back into this world are, are very you know, advanced folks. Are very what? Advanced, helpful beings? Uh, not necessarily, no. But the, uh, but the more advanced that they are, then the greater help they could offer. You know, fortunately, the course to... Excuse me? I guess I'm wondering if um, one could be influenced by unhelpful beings. Well, you can't be, be influenced by anything that's outside of you. you know, if you are fearful, then you're not going to accept help that comes to you from a loving source. You know, I think that's another kind of subtle way that the ego traps us into believing ourselves as victims. Uh, now let me talk now about the uh, children's deaths, all right? Uh, which I promise I will do. Uh, I think it's very difficult to understand that. Well, it's difficult to understand it anyway. But it's especially difficult, I think, to understand that without having some, some belief system that, that, that involves reincarnation. Let me say... A couple of things about what the Course does with that. Uh, there's only one place in the Course where it discusses the subject, and that's in the teacher's manual. And then what it does is it straddle the fence. Uh, and the reason it does that uh, is that it says that it seeks to avoid controversy. And, and that's one subject which would be very, very controversial in the world. <clears throat> it does not seek to take a position on something that would cause people to either accept the Course because of it or not accept it because of it, regardless of what the position was. Uh, 
And what it says is that if a teacher of God believes in reincarnation, it's very, uh, be very rare that the Holy Spirit would ask him to, to give up his belief. It would also mean that if a person does not believe in it, that he would be asked that he, that he do believe in it. To believe in reincarnation is not crucial to working with the Course. In fact, it's irrelevant to it. Because whether you believe in past lives or not, you still have to work out your salvation right here and now. You know, one of the big mistakes that people make who believe in reincarnation and get involved with it is they believe that it's the past life that I had way back when that's responsible for my difficulty now. That's the same mistake that Freudians made by saying, what happened to me when I was a little child is what's determining what's happening to me now. You know, the idea that the child is father of the man. Or that people who are now studying what happens in the womb, saying what happens to the mother, by the, what the mother's carrying the child, will affect what happens to that child later on. Now, within the ego's world, all of those would be true. There is no question within the ego's illusion of time, we are... Uh, the effects of the past. You know, that the past will affect how we are in the future. But the mistake is, is in believing that that's, that, that that's what the determinant agent is. The reason the past can affect us in the present or in the future is because of a decision that we make in the present. Whatever happened to me, whether it happened yesterday, 40 years ago, or 400 or 4,000 years ago, that could have no effect on me this instant unless I made a decision in this instant that that would affect me. You know, we cannot, we cannot be hurt by the past. It's a workbook lesson that says, the past is over, it can touch me not. But it will not be over as long as we believe in it. So that's why it would be, be the same mistake as psychology is made to believe that the reason I'm in the mess I'm in today is because of what happened in ancient Egypt. Now the Course's view of that will be that whatever happened in ancient Egypt and was not healed, I'm now given another chance. But the reason that I'm suffering today is not because of what happened whenever it was in the past. That's why the Course says it is not necessary to believe in reincarnation to practice what it says. However, it does seem to suggest rather clearly in many different places in the text that this is not the first time we've come. Right? Without saying it in so many words, it certainly seems to imply that. So when it says, for example, you can save a thousand years, which it says in a number of places, I think the explanation for that is what we've already talked about that you could save going through many lifetimes to work out a problem by working it out in a, in a difficult relation, relationship or situation right here in the present. It says at one point when it's talking about standing in front of this last veil, which is the veil before the fear of God, that you have the choice whether you will, you will recognize what is happening or you will wander off only to come this way again. I think what it's talking about is not necessarily only in this particular lifetime, but you'll have to go the same path another time and work it through. So again, I think the Course does suggest that this is not the first time we've come. And in the, in the, uh, in the image of this carpet, that this whole expanse of the carpet would consist of, of the many lifetimes that we would have. But again, if you do not believe that concept, that, that should have no bearing on your work with the Course. And you want to read that, that, that section in the manual. I want to see if I have this clear. He said, it isn't what happened in a past life or before birth, but the decision that we made at the time. That's what I want to get clear. At the time of a traumatic occurrence, we made a decision. No, what, what we are in charge of is our reaction to something. So, so that reaction then was not to accept and forgive, or lovingly and willingly accept and forgive but to hold it as though something was done to us and we're the victim. Right. That's, in other words, all statements of the past are saying the reason I'm unhappy today is because of what was done to me whenever or because of what I did whenever. That's not the reason that I'm unhappy. The reason I'm unhappy is because of a decision that I've made now. If we do not believe that, then we're doing exactly what the ego wants because we're taking away from the mind its power to correct itself. We're saying, I'm not responsible for what I'm feeling. Something from outside of me, even if it's a past life, something from outside of me is, is, uh, is determining how I feel. And I'm, I'm the victim of what that is. And that's why the Course places such a strong emphasis on the power of the mind. Since the mind chose wrongly, it is only the mind that can correct itself. And it corrects itself by saying, I no longer want this. And that's what allows the Holy Spirit to remove it for us, from us. So, so whenever we see ourselves as the victim, 
we are depriving our mind of the power to, to correct itself. <coughs> All right, now they, yes. I think this is a very good time to relate that to the chronic illness or chronic condition or chronic condition. You know, the bad situation that seems right. to bug you for a long time. Okay, there's a wonderful line right at the end of the text that says, trials are but lessons that you failed to learn, presented once again. So where you made a faulty choice before, you now can make a better one. All right, that's the explanation for that. Uh, that. That situations that we had not healed in the past, situations that brought out a certain expression of guilt in us that were not healed, will recur over and over again, sometimes with the same person, sometimes with different people so that we will have another opportunity. It is not because the Holy Spirit is, is kind of cruelly playing a joke on us or that he's punishing us. It's a loving opportunity to heal ourselves of something that otherwise would never be healed and therefore we would never be happy. That's the right-minded way of looking at any chronic problem. It's an expression of something that we have not healed, that we have not forgiven in ourselves, so it's coming around again so that it can be healed. So as Joel said, just keep on keeping on. Right. So you keep on keeping on, but you don't keep on alone. <laughs> all right, now, yes, Sharon. You said something earlier about how you could learn all of this in a monastery or something, mm. or all by yourself in a cave, and yet I kept thinking... Well, not this system you can't. No, no, no. No, no. Well... You can't go without someone else. Yes, except even there, there probably would be exceptions, in the sense that uh, even if you're all by yourself physically, in your mind you've got a lot of people there. You know, again, healing of relationships has nothing to do with what you do face-to-face -face with somebody. It only has to do within your mind. So you could be like on a mountaintop in Israel, as I was, and you still have a lot of, a lot of people there with you, you know. Okay. Right. Right. Yes? Um, I was saying about that, to me, it seems not so difficult to heal by myself. Thinking of someone, and yet, I was thinking about it. I feel like it would be more difficult to do that thing. Well, if you're saying that it's difficult to do it face to face, it must be because there's something in you that's afraid. Uh, and that's an ego thing, you know. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit will demand that you do it face to face, you know. Uh, but then you'd have to look at your own fear. Because then what you're trying to do is program Him and saying to Him, I'm willing to forgive, but I'm not willing to forgive in this way. You know, and that's a bargain. Uh, so that. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to do it, but you at least have to look at the fear inside of you. All right, now let me address the, the question of children. Uh, the question basically is, how do you explain uh, an infant becoming sick or an infant dying? And uh, as I said right at the beginning of this discussion, in some way we can understand it or explain it. But I think that the attitude that we should have towards it is that in some way that we're not aware of, that particular form that that person has chosen. And sickness is chosen just like death is chosen. You know, there's a line that comes in the workbook and also in the text that says, no one dies without his own consent. And we are the ones who cho we choose when we come into this world and we choose when we leave this world. So for reasons that we're not aware of, a person may choose to come into this world, contract a fatal illness at two months, and then leave. And we don't have to understand what that is. All that, all that we do have to understand is that there's a purpose behind it that we do not understand. If it bothers us, then we realize that one of the purposes of, of that two-month death was to help us heal our mind. Because one of the important parts of that person's lesson would involve that person's family, person's uh, friends of the family, medical people who were involved or whatever. And it's all an opportunity that we could learn that death is not what it seems. And that again, in reality, nothing has happened. All that's happened is that there's been a shift of forms. You know, one of the big problems of this world, obviously, as we all know, is death. And of course, what we do, what we do is that we, if we make death real, then we're making the ego real. Of course, that's an integral part of the ego system. It's only the body that dies. And of course, the Course does an interesting... You want me to stop? The Course does an interesting thing with death when it talks about the obstacles of peace, of which there are four. The third obstacle to peace is the attraction of death. Most people would think it should be the fear of death. But remember that if you're afraid of death, then you're making it real. And if you're making it real, then you're attracted to it. 
So the ego will have us do is become afraid of it, which is just another way of being attracted to it. Because we're making it real. We believe that, that death is something that happens. And people who are attracted to death, those people who contemplate suicide as being a way of getting out of this world, they're making the same mistake. Because they're making this world real, and then death becomes the magical way of resolving th- their problems. About that? Yes, so sorry. Yes, I will. There's a line in the Course that says, there's a risk in thinking death is peace. And now what happens with people who think that death is peace is that they believe that this world is hell and that they'd be better off being free of this world. You know, most of us at one point or another have this kind of feeling. But what we've done again is make the mistake of believing that the problem is in the world and in the body, and therefore we'll be free of the problems of the world and of the body if we leave the body. And what we forget is that the problem is not out here, the problem is in the mind. And when we die, our bodies may die, but we take our mind with us. We take the ego with us. The ego does not disappear. The ego is not the body. The ego is the thought of separation which takes form in the body, but the ego is more than, than the body. We can die, and the body will die, but the ego will live on. Is it then the ego that reincarnates? Yes, sure. That, that, that is what reincarnates. Is the well, spirit doesn't have to do that. <laughs> you know, this world's a classroom, so spirit doesn't have to learn anything. It's only the ego that has to learn. The Holy Spirit goes with us, right? Yes, the Holy Spirit is always with us. Yeah. Right. The person who committed suicide made that choice at some time before... Well, I think that, that before we come, we do make a choice how we're going to live, what lessons we're going to learn, but we could always change our mind. We say, well, I, ch- I don't want to learn this lesson now. You know, I don't want to learn this lesson this lifetime, I want to learn another lifetime, or whatever, you know, at a different point of the carpet. And the person just decides, I've had it, I'm checking out. All that that means is that the guilt stage will be more reinforced, uh, and you're just going to have to work it out. That's why some metaphysical systems teach that, that, that a suicide really sets you back. You know, that if you're over here and you commit suicide, you're going to go further back the other way. And the reason for that would be because you're reinforcing your guilt. Because you're making guilt real and then you're trying to, to, to solve it through some magical means which only pushes the guilt down and kind of uh, stays there. How so, can people who are connected with the person who wants to suicide help? Can they just help themselves by asking to forgive and to see the lessons of them? They can't help that person. And the person who's already died through, through suicide, well, you could forgive them. <laughs> you know, that would help a great deal. But the, again, one of the crucial things in the ego system, as we've already seen, especially when we talked about Jesus, is the whole idea that death is real and that death is to be feared. So somebody who's concerned about why does an infant die is really making death into a problem. And really what the right attitude should be is that that's what that infant, so that's what that person's lesson was for reasons that we don't necessarily understand or have to understand. And it, it's easier to understand what the lessons are for, for the people who survive. And the same would be for any kind of infant, uh, sick, infantile sickness. Sickness is always a defense, it's always an expression of guilt. But it doesn't have to be in the same conscious way we would be aware of it as adults. You know, children are born into this world not pure and innocent and holy and good. You know, if they're so pure and innocent and holy and good, then they wouldn't have to be here. Children are born into this world with the same rotten egos that we all have. <laughs> Again, otherwise they would not be here. They are not pure beings who are, are corrupted by the impure world. You know, this was Rousseau's idea. You know, it's a very naive idea. You know, that is, the reality is that we come into this world with guilt, with lessons that have to be learned. Ken, that's awful hard for a new grandmother to take. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we all born into the world in the very same way? In the same bodies? Wow. In part we share the in part we share the the illusion. I'll answer this a little bit bit more in a minute. What would you say about a person that cannot in any shape, form, or fashion accept responsibility that they did something wrong? Well, what happens then is that their own guilt will just stay buried, and uh, and all they have to do is getting further and further stuck in the world. Am I answering your question? Or I'm not, I mean, what do you do with that person? No, I mean, is that person just manifesting more and more of suppression of guilt? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. 
when you were talking about the diagram up here, you said something that when the uh, carpeting was laid out, it was laid out with all these events in it. Uh, and then you're talking a while ago about, well, uh, I may not choose to do what was here this lesson than another. In, in one sense, I, I get perhaps a sense of predestination. In the other sense, what what is there, what is... What are you saying, that the content's here, but the form That's we right. can choose? That's right. And, and we choose the time in which we're going to... to to learn it. But that's what the, the Course says, that we cannot choose the form of the script that's already set. What we can choose is the time in which we'll learn it. So, so in that sense, free, free will has meaning. Do you want to take a break or do you want to go, go on? Want to take a break? Okay. Look, anyway, so... Got the one? The transcription would be somewhat repetitive of your books that are upcoming. Um, yeah, there's a book I'm finishing up, which really is like an extension of the great pamphlet, but in much greater detail, but it really have all the things we talked about. So uh, it seems silly to, to edit a uh, kind of 400 or 500-page transcript when the book would be the same thing. I'd love to hear some more of your thoughts, Ken. Well, these little babies come into the world, the big girls get started. Can we get into that? That's right. There are uh, two things I want to talk about. Uh, first is babies and children, and then the relationship between parents and children, which I think would be an important one. Uh, then answer kind of a few other questions, and then I'd like to spend the rest of our time going through a particular section in the text together, so that we can have a feel for really uh, uh, how the Course treats all the things we've been talking about. Okay. Uh, first, just uh, let me say in terms of death, that the best treatment that you'll find in any of the material about what death really is uh, comes in the Song of Prayer, that, that little pamphlet that Joyce held up and, and <clears throat> it's in the section called false versus true healing which is the best description you'll find of how the Holy Spirit looks at death which basically is just a quiet laying down of the body uh, that idea is found in different places in the course but it's, it's clearest uh, and it's loveliest exposition will be found in that in that section for, for those of you that have it um, let me talk a little bit about uh, children again as I've been saying uh, children come into this world with the same ego and, and guilt that we identify with as adults. It's one of the paradoxes of our life here, human life, is that we have to spend the first part of our lives building up an ego, building up the awareness and the sense of an individual self, so that in the second half of our life we could realize that that's not who we are at all. But you can't skip over that first part of the, of the process. Uh, Jung once said a uh, very wise thing he said a lot of wise things but the, among them was he said that the, that every problem uh, that occurs to somebody who's over the age of 35 is a spiritual problem now the specific age you don't have to be be bound to I think we could think of that roughly as being uh, somebody who's in the second half of his or her life and that can start when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s or 60s or 80s doesn't matter but basically what he was saying, I think, was reflecting this process, that we spend the first half of our life developing the ego, all the abilities and the characteristics and the traits that we have, the ability to live in the world physically, the ability to live in the world psychologically, and the ability to live in the world socially. And then what happens at a certain point in our life is that we have to make a decision then at whose service we're going to place all of these abilities, whether we place them on the hands of the ego or the hands of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's a spiritual problem. So it's another way of saying what we've been talking about, that the problem is never over here in the world. The problem will always be whose voice we're going to, to listen to. That's what makes it a spiritual problem. <clears throat> For somebody who does not develop a sense of personal identity, that person becomes psychotic. I'm talking of a child now. A child who does not develop a sense of where he begins and leaves off and where the world begins and leaves off, that child is psychotic, and the most extreme form of that is what, what is known, as, known of as autism. We do not experience a separation between yourself and the world. This is not an experience of mysticism. This is not a mystical or spiritual experience. When mystics talk of being at one with the universe and with God, they are not talking about this particular kind of experience. This is psychosis. Right? It is not holiness. That it is imperative for a child to, to learn who he or she is. Which means that you develop a sense, again, of personal identity. And it begins on a very kind of, kind of basic physical level, and then it evolves psychologically and socially. 
Now, what this is from the from the from the overall context or perspective we've been talking about is that these the the specific forms in which we identify ourselves, the specific abilities that that we develop, all these become part of the lessons or the forms in which the Holy Spirit will teach us His lessons of forgiveness. It is no accident uh, that we're born into specific families, that our parents then become the the ones onto whom we'll project all of the guilt in one way or another, and then these become the people that we have to learn to forgive, which I'll elaborate on in a minute. So that it is not helpful to a child, if you're the parent, to say, you know, you don't have to worry about running out in the street because your body's an illusion and the car's an illusion. You know, that's not helpful. The helpful thing is to teach the child what the laws of the world are, but you teach them knowing that the law is that the world is an illusion. But in a sense, what you're doing is setting the stage so that the child can, can then learn this lesson later on. We must first have to learn what the boundaries are of the ego's world before we can get beyond them. If you do not do this once again, that is not spirituality, that, that is psychosis. Because what you're really doing is building up fear and guilt. So, so again, it is a paradox of our human life that we have to spend uh, a goodly portion of this life building up a sense of ego identity so that we can then decide that this is not the identity that we want. And then we place this ego identity in the service of the Holy Spirit who then uses it so that it not only teaches ourselves but teaches other people. You know, when people speak, as they love to do these days, of, of the mid-age crisis or the crisis of being 40, whatever, the real crisis has nothing to do with what people write about, which is only written from the standpoint of the ego. And there's no question that, that, that you can make a case for all those within this, this framework. But the real crisis that people face is, is the crisis we're just talking about. You know, who is my teacher? You know, whom do, who do I really want to be when I grow up? You know, do, do I want to be a child of God or continue believing that I'm a child of the ego? And that is always what the crisis is. Now, now the ego will interpret that as being all kinds of other things because the ego will become very threatened when you're saying, I no longer want to follow you, but I want to follow God just as we've seen. That's where the depression comes from. That's where the sense of aging comes from. That's where the sense of loss comes from. And it's not because of anything that happens to the body. If you believe that, then you're saying you're the victim of the body, which is the, the same, same old thing we've, we've already seen. The only, the only cause of any sense of depression or loss or aging, etc., is, is a decision made in the mind. And it could always be understood in the context of which teacher we will follow. Are you saying if we choose to follow the Holy Spirit, then, then we age? Well, your body may age, uh, but since you're not identified with the body, you won't feel, feel, feel as if you're aging. Oh, remember, age, remember the idea that just as sickness is not something that happens to the body but to the mind, so is old age. It seems to have uh, expression in the body, but that's part of the, of the illusion. And that's, of course, is why people will quote fear death. You know, something is happening to their body. If you know that you're not a body, then you're very glad that you're going home. A good fr a friend of ours had an Indian master who died many years ago, a very, very holy man, and, and she was describing how near the end of his life, when he knew he was dying, and he was kind of telling his disciples and followers that he was doing that, people were, were mourning and were crying and everything else, and he said, why are you crying? You should be happy. I'm going home. You know, an interesting story with that, too, is that a couple years before that, his wife was dying. And he said to her, he said, oh, you can't die tomorrow because I have this important meeting out of town or wherever it was, and so can't you, can't you hold it off another day? Which she did, and then he came back and he was with her when she, when she died. Now, when you realize that the whole thing is an illusion, then it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. Yes, Jane? Can I get real clear on the uh, autism, the thing about autism? Well, what autism is, is, the, is a state when you don't experience any barrier between yourself and the world. Which means you can't function in the world. Okay? Uh, let me talk a little bit now about uh, parents and children. Uh, without question, the most important of all the special relationships that we have is that between ourselves and our parents. It is the one that has the longest history, <coughs> because it begins when we, when we are born. Uh, it is also the one that contains the greatest guilt, because it is the one that contains the greatest dependency. Remember, we, when we talked about specialness, on Monday, uh, that we talked about that special relationship is really another word for, for guilt, uh, for dependency. All right, now, as we also had emphasized, you can't avoid having special relationships in this world. An infant cannot avoid being dependent on its parents. So this is not a sin. 
is really just describing what the situation is, which then becomes the Holy Spirit's classroom for teaching us that, that, that only God's relationship with us is special. Uh, Freud said it's a very interesting thing, and it's kind of ironic that, that uh, his theory can be used this way. Uh, he stated that the, that, the, that the key or the goal of a successful psychoanalysis was the resolution of the Oedipus complex. This was the key concept in, in psychoanalytic theory, and it was the resolution of this problem that they really had with it the key to uh, successful uh, therapy. And what the Oedipus complex is, is when the child forms a positive relationship with the parent of the opposite sex and a negative relationship with the parent of the same sex who's perceived as a rival. And it takes its name, of course, from the Greek myth of Oedipus who killed his father and he married his mother without knowing he was doing that. Now, what Freud is really talking about in the Oedipus complex is nothing more than special hate and special love, where the child will form a special love attraction to the parent of the opposite sex who's perceived as being the savior or the idol. You know, when I'm with you, then I feel good. And the parent of the same sex is perceived as the rival, as the one who's the object of hatred, who has to be gotten, free, or we have to be gotten free of that person, or he has to be gotten out of the way, taken out of our way, so that we could possess the parent of the opposite sex. So in the Oedipus complex, we have special hate and special love, and Freud was quite correct, although he would not have said it the way we're saying it, that, that until we could successfully resolve the problems of unforgiveness, or the problems of special love and special hate with our parents, we will never know that we are children of God. As long as we believe that salvation depends on one of our parents meeting our needs, then we're saying, you are my special love object and not God. Then what you're doing is you're reinforcing the very problem of sin and guilt. At the same time, if you feel that you have some resentment against one of your parents and you feel justified, however justified you may feel, then you're saying that you are the source of all of my, my problems. And of course, what that does is just keep the ego's thought system going. And as long as any, as either of these two things continue, then we're excluding God and we're reinforcing the ego. We cannot know our true identity as children of God, who is our parent and is our source, as long as we are holding something against our parents. Because as long as we're doing that, we're saying, there's something that I need from you. Which is another way of saying, I am your child. And if we believe we're children of our parents, we cannot identify with being children of God. This does not mean that when you identify with being a child of God, you forget about your parents. It doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that you, that you don't love them, you don't respect them, you don't send them Mother's Day cards if that's what you do or whatever. What it does mean is that, is that you recognize who these people really are. You no longer see them as your mother and your father. You see them as your brother and as your sister in Christ who is walking the same road back to heaven that you are. And they were given to you in that form because that's the form in which you will learn your lessons. And you always have to be respectful of the form. Remember, the Course doesn't teach you to transcend the form. You, you transform it. You shift its purpose from, from guilt to forgiveness. So this does not mean that you still do not do whatever it is that you always did with your parents, but you now do, don't do that of guilt. You don't do that of obligation. You don't do that of resentment. You do it out of love. But it does require this very important shift where you no longer see your parents as being special but you see them as being just the same as everybody else, but that sameness is expressed in a specific form. And again, we live in a world of forms, and the Course does not tell us that we deny those, those forms. We live within those forms, but we live within those forms differently. You know, if, if there's any one specific problem that we all share, that's the specific problem. We all have parents. This means we will all have problems of forgiveness that will center upon our parents. Again, this is not a bad thing. You can't avoid this in this world. Again, we come into this world and, and the way that the system has been worked out, it demands that we be dependent on our parents. And so you don't deny the dependency, but, but as you grow up, you realize what the dependency is, and then as an adult, you can make another choice. And basically, again, it's a choice to see them as being your brother and your sister, not as your mother and your father. So then, as parents... We take the same attitude towards our children. Right. That's right. You remain within the form, but you realize that the form is not what it is. So when the, when the, when the child is younger, of course, you will assume whatever the responsibilities that 
a society says you you assume. And part of that is to really be be the teacher of that child, so that when that child grows up, the child can then transfer teachers. And realize and realize again that that his teacher and his parent is not you, as the mother or the father, but God, or the Holy Spirit. And of course, as we've seen, your parents no longer have to be alive for you to forgive them. You know, relationships are in the mind and relationships are eternal. So you do not require the physical presence of somebody for you to change your mind about them. You know, sometimes it makes it easier if the person's there, other times it makes it difficult. <clears throat> but what makes it difficult really is because of all the guilt that's being engendered. <coughs> course to children other than living it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you just answered your own question. The question was, is there a way to teach the course with children other than living it? I think that's the way you teach it. I, I don't think children need a course in miracles. You know, I think it's, it's parents who need it or teachers or, or the adults in a child's life who would need it. I think if the adults in a child's life are, are practicing the course and believing in it, then that's all they have to do. Then this is for the last half of our, of our lives. Is that... Mm-hmm. In one sense, yes. Well, you know, the, the course is written on a, an adult level, uh, and it doesn't need it doesn't need anything else. And again, I think all that children need, in the sense of children are anybody needing anything, is for parents to kind of you know live the course and practice it. Which doesn't mean you have to teach it in terms of its concepts. You merely have to demonstrate. That's what I was just going to say. It's like. You don't just have to teach children the course by living it. You can only teach it to anybody by living it, right. including yourself. Absolutely right. Okay. Are there any other questions about it, about this or any of the things that we talked about? Yeah. Just keep it right there. Mavis had one question that I promised that I, that, that I answered and I didn't answer before, and that was the question as why is the course so goddamn wordy? Is that a direct quote, Mavis? Is that what you said? <laughs> Uh, I think that the course is so-called called wordiness is part of its uh, well, part of its charm. I think it's also I think part of its purpose. Uh, the complaint is frequently made. It says the same thing over and over again, uh, w- which is true. I think that's where it gets its power from. I-, I think that its its length makes sense when you realize and remember that its purpose, as we I think said right at the beginning, is not to teach an intellectual thought system, but to lead us towards an experience. So that while the same material continually recurs. It will continually recur in different forms, uh, in different ways, and at deeper levels. And the idea, again, is to, be, is to know that you're being led along, and that you just follow along as you're being, being led. At that point, you may feel that the course is too short. Uh, my, my objection was not that it presented the same concepts over and over. I understand that. It was why it presented the concepts in such a wordy manner to begin with. <laughs> That's why it was, and, and my question to you was, do you think that there are any extra words? Or do you think that, <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that a few words could have been edited and we could have still gotten the same benefit from the course? You and I said, I said no, right? <laughs> and you said a, a no and you compared it to the, to a symphony and, the, and and I would like to get that on tape if you could do it again. Yeah. Uh, Shall I sing the symphony? Yeah, you know, the, the, the comparison to the symphony. Right, I think that the development of the course, I think, is really symphonic. I mean, I tend to think of thing, things musically, uh, but I think that the course is constructed like a symphony. And I think that uh, that when you hear a great symphony, you don't question whether it's long or not. You know, Beethoven's symphony seems to be very long until, until you really enter into it, and then it seems, seems absolutely perfect. And I think it's like that with the course, too, that, that you're, you're being led around and around and through in terms of an experience. And so it's not the words that, that are teaching you. It's really the presence that's beyond the words. And that's why you don't have to understand each and every word when you read it. Just like the first time you hear a symphony, you don't remember everything. And most people, unless they're kind of musicologists, don't sit down and analyze. You know, now it's this theme, and now the theme is being reintroduced, and now it's being developed, and now the composer is modulating from a minor key to a major key, and all that stuff. Most people don't care about that. And what you really do is that you just let the music have its effect on you, and then you let the composer take you wherever the composer is taking you. I think it's the same thing, thing with the course. The difference, of course, is that it is using words and it is using concepts, but its purpose is always to lead you beyond what the words are saying. So that line I think we quoted before sometime, that words are but symbols twice removed from reality. So the course uses words, but it uses them to lead you to an experience that's beyond the symbolism. Okay. Is that what I said before? Okay. Uh, 
Uh, I've heard the, the concept of God. In particular, I heard it uh, in one place, but one from like oh the Lord that when a baby dies, the baby grows up in the spirit world. Like uh, there's some really, uh, uh, you know, the guys that continue to grow and maybe still aware of the parents. Well, there are metaphysical systems that, that talk about the, that learning occurs on other planes, but those other planes would still be within the ego's world. Uh, the course really stick, sticks in this world since I think it, it would say that this is where the heaviest learning would have to occur since this is where the mistakes are made you know in the world of form in the world of body but the other world would be ego worlds too how many worlds have been? excuse me? how many worlds have been? in other words only two worlds there's, there's the ego's world and God's world and the ego's world may have many different levels the course doesn't really make a distinction between them among them uh, why don't we try to to work with something in the text of do most of you have your textbooks with you? I meant to, to mention that last night, and I didn't. Uh, right, but, but I didn't ask you to bring it, but okay, good, I'm glad you did. Did you actually stop the tape? Yeah, you stopped.